Light, a WISN 12 Commitment 2016 special, a conversation with the candidates for Milwaukee County Executive, the incumbent, Chris Abley, leading the county since 2011, the challenger, Chris Larson, Democratic State Senator and former county board member, the county, home to almost a million people, the state's biggest airport, and world-class parks. Among the issues, taxes, the aging domes, and mass transit. And now, live from the Marquette University Law School, here is tonight's moderator, WISN 12 News political analyst and upfront host, Mike Goucher. And welcome to our conversation with the candidates. We're joining you live tonight from Eckstein Hall at Marquette University Law School, where I also work as a fellow in law and public policy. During the next hour, we'll be hearing from the candidates for Milwaukee County Executive, incumbent Chris Abley, and his challenger, State Senator Chris Larson. If the February primary was any indication, this is a very competitive contest. The two candidates were separated by just about 700 votes in February, setting up a showdown on April 5th. Our rules for tonight are pretty simple. I'll be asking the candidates questions about their views, many important county issues, and what qualifies each of them to lead Milwaukee County for the next four years. I'll be asking them to answer those questions directly and concisely and to stay on point. The candidates can certainly talk to one another, but I'll manage the time on any given topic and we'll have the freedom to move the conversation along. Toward the end of this hour, each candidate will be asked to make a closing statement. That said, we have a lot to get to tonight, and we'll begin with the county executive, Chris Abley, who gets our first question. Actually, it's the same question for both of you, and I, I wondered if briefly you would tell the voters of Milwaukee County what's at stake in this election. Uh, to me, I think what's at stake is uh, continued momentum. Uh, you know, five years ago when I ran, uh, the last significant analysis of the county was done by the Public Policy Forum and the subtitle to it was should it, should it stay or should it go? Uh, you know, existential question. The debt was so big and had been growing and it was essentially a drag shoot uh, on the services of the county which had been declining. Deferred maintenance had been uh, 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 accumulating as had been well documented. Uh, and, you know, uh, we've made an enormous amount of progress. Uh, you know, we've stopped raising bus fares, we've stopped cutting routes, haven't done it once in five years. Uh, we started restoring services, we've added new services, we're serving thousands more people. I've got a phenomenal team. Uh, and uh, I'm focused on exactly what I was focused on five years ago, which isn't, uh, you know, a political win. It isn't a headline. It's just about what can I do to make the county work more effectively. Senator Larson, from your vantage point, what's at stake for voters in this county? Yeah, I mean, I think quite simply it's a control uh, over our county's future. Uh, we've seen over the last few years uh, consolidation of power into the county executive's office. We've seen control taken away over uh, land sales where the county board has been cut out of the process. Uh, we've seen bills float that would take away uh, some of the, the uh, public's purview on policy making and budgeting. And I think that becomes dangerous. So I think it's important to elect a county executive who's going to make this public office uh, public again. Somebody who's going to go out and listen to uh, the community year after year with, with uh, community listening sessions so we can have a conversation about where we go as a future. Uh, it's about whether we're going to have uh, access to quality parks. I believe every family should have access to a quality park. And uh, we'll put together a plan to be able to get us to that. So it's, it's, uh, it's a control of our future. What's interesting about this race is you're being challenged from the left by a Democrat. Your first election, we were challenged by a Republican. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and this time it's different. And, and the sure. argument of Democrats that you hear is that this is not the guy we elected, that he's too cozy with Republicans, sure. that he's amassed too much power in his own hands, that he's too disconnected with struggling working folks. Sure. They say you've changed, have you? Well, when I ran the first time, uh, I ran an ad uh, that I was particularly fond of saying that uh, I don't care if it's a Democratic idea or a Republican idea. If it's a good idea, uh, we'll do it. Uh, I had two campaign co-chairs. I had uh, my good and now departed friend Mark Murata. Uh, and I had uh, Shell Lubar, and one of the things that was intriguing to me and was sort of the point that I think naively I hope people would see is they get along and they agree on most things. Uh, 
You know, it's been interesting to me that uh, I'll be the first to admit to anybody, my politics uh, confuse a lot of people. Uh, I don't wake up and say, what's the party line? Um, you know, I don't uh, wake up and say, hey, is my team winning or your team losing? And I have no hesitation working with anybody I can, uh, a Republican or Democrat, uh, to move the county forward. But to be clear, we have moved the county forward. Uh, you know, uh, the great example is precisely because I've done that and worked hard to have good relationships with both sides, uh, when we were able uh, to pass the law that enabled all this great um, reform of the Behavioral Health Division, I mean, we finally stopped warehousing people. We were warehousing people. We don't do that anymore. Uh, we're serving more people, ER visits down, involuntary detentions down. We passed that law, uh, I think it was 122 to 2 in 2013 in Wisconsin. So with two exceptions, that's every Republican and every Democrat. And I like to think part of that is because I wasn't making it about who wins or who loses. It was about doing right. And uh, I said that that's, I would work with anybody. I, I will tell you right now, I will continue to work with anybody I can. Let me have you respond to that. What is wrong with the notion of saying, I'm going to reach across the aisle. I'm going to do what I think is necessary to benefit the citizens of Milwaukee County. I don't care what their politics are. If it can help the county, I'm going to do that. What's wrong with that? I think that would have been good if that's what happened. But what instead what's happened is the current county executive has used that power, has used that ability to work with other uh, other people to consolidate power for himself, right? Uh, we've seen that happen over the unilateral land deals. We saw that uh, where the, the land was sold for a dollar over at uh, the Park East. And his negotiations uh, ensure that the public would deliberately be cut out of it and not have a say. And in selling it for a dollar, you ended up actually, uh, the, the taxpayers actually had to pick up an additional $5.1 million uh, in the underlying costs. So not only did, did this land get sold for a dollar because the public wasn't at the table, uh, they got change in $5.1 million cleanup being covered by us. You know, every time uh, there's, there's, there's policy being done, it seems to benefit him or his office, where his office has now grown. Um, and I think it would be good if it actually benefited the public. Because it hasn't, you've seen so many people who supported the current county executive come over to our side, including the congresswoman, including a majority of the state senators in the area, state representatives, uh, and a lot of other civic leaders have come over to our side and say it's time to actually move Milwaukee County forward again. County Executive Abel, looks like you want to respond to that. Yes, I do. Uh, well, first, you know, this power grab thing, I mean, it's an interesting line, and it's sort of dramatic, and I've been tr puzzling uh, to try and understand exactly what it means. One of the things I say all the time is uh, the resources that I get to make decisions about uh, aren't my resources, they're yours. I've never been unclear about that. Uh, you know, power grab is more like an elected official who's running for every new office that pops up every two years, and it's not about uh, for me, that's not what it's about. I didn't run because, you know, I want to win some fight. Uh, you know, power, you know, the changes that have been made have been made by elected officials. Uh, the process but you supported for land. them, correct? Oh, absolutely, yeah. And everybody, you know, but they're elected. That's the whole point. Uh, and to say that no progress has been made, uh, you know, we're serving thousands more people than we were. And if you don't see that as progress, I mean, we're paying millions less in debt service every year. We're able to do better. Uh, I mean, we have departments that aren't just restored services. We're setting records and getting, you know, modeled nationally uh, for the work. That is progress. D define uh, power grabs more specifically. You mentioned the land sales, but, right. but what else are you talking about? Right, where you're cutting out the American style check and balance in our local democracy. That's what I mean by power grab. Yes, he's gotten this authority from politicians who he's given max contributions to. That doesn't make it dem democratic. Um, the problem is, is if you have these land sales that happen now, you've cut out the county board. Uh, you've cut out the public purview, where in some cases the only time the public will find out about it is when uh, the receipt is, is thrown out there. So now we've suddenly put at risk the airport, the zoo, the museum. We found out about 43 parks. We found out about thousands of acres. And not necessarily, Mike, that this county executive is going to start selling off this land, but suddenly this power is there, this power is available, and people have a memory. That that's what the previous county executive, each of those things that he was trying to sell or privatize, consolidating that much power, that's a power grab and that's dangerous and we're looking to correct it and give the power back to the people. I'll give you a, a moment here because I know you're, you're, you're itching to get into this, but one more question on that. You served on the county board. Do you think the county board, based on what you know about it, was doing a good job? 
when you were on there and in the years prior to that? Yeah, I mean, look, when I was there, we were correcting Scott Walker's failed budgets. Uh, these were budgets that were going after services that we cared about. They were slashing uh, transit service. They were going after uh, programs that we cared about, uh, going after uh, parks, cutting parks funding. And so what we did is we tried to say, okay, he's got these make-believe budgets where he's saying he's freezing property taxes, but everyone knows he's not. It's just a gimmick. So we actually had to do the real work of putting to, to, together a budget year after year. And uh, I think it's unfortunate that, that that gimmick, that tradition, has continued under this current county executive. I think it's time to have an honest conversation about where our county's at and where it's going to go. Uh, so we continue to do the best that we can, and uh, I think we can do a whole lot more with a county executive who's going to listen to people and be honest about budgeting. I'll let you respond to that. Sure. Well, first in the land sales, uh, the uh, uh, new land sales process requires uh, the sign-off of the independently elected comptroller uh, and the uh, village president or mayor of whatever the municipality is uh, that uh, the land in question is there. Um, as you know, at the state level, uh, you know, the legislature is not involved on a ton of these processes. But more importantly, I mean, again, you know, it's, it's the sort of dark rhetoric. Here's the thing. Um, if, if you were correcting at the time, uh, Scott Walker's, you know, budget issues that you, you, you thought were mistakes, uh, the fact is transit was still getting more expensive and fares are, and uh, uh, routes were being cut for five years. I mean, for five years we've never raised fares, we've never cut routes, and I'm just, this is an example, and there's plenty of them, but you're, you have to go back pretty far pretty far to find another five year period where that hasn't happened. And again, you know, uh, I do think about the people. I think about the people who ride the bus and take it to work. The reason we put, and I think it's worth millions more in county tax levy to not raise fares is because I know exactly how important it is. Uh, you know, you don't want to make something that people have to pay for more expensive and it's worth fighting to keep it down. And in a way that wasn't happening before, that's what we've done. Senator Larson? Yeah, I, I don't think continuing the same policies of Scott Walker is a, is a, is a flag to put down and say that that's a success. We, we continue to have among the highest bus fares in the entire country. Some of the big transit expansions happened due to a lawsuit and due to federal funding coming in and saving the day, which is good. But we need to have an honest conversation about how we get to dedicated funding because Milwaukee is one of the last major metropolitan areas in the entire country not to have dedicated funding. We have a plan to get there. Uh, this current county executive does not. And I think the other, shifting back to the whole uh, uh, point of the question, talking about power grabs, these things have happened. They didn't just, all of a sudden, the legislature decided to do these, Governor Walker decided to sign these. These were things that were initiated by the current county executive, and we have never heard an explanation as to why he wants this power over land sales, over policy making, over budgeting. That's where it gets to be dangerous. So, so what you're talking about in terms of, of, of uh, power grabs, I, I want to uh, go just a little bit further with this discussion. Um, what do you want done about that? You're, you're going to go to the legislature and say you need to repeal this legislation that gives the county executive additional power? What are you going to do about it? Yeah, I think first and foremost, by electing a county executive who's not interested in further condensing and consolidating power in the office, that would stop two additional power grabs that are in the works. One has to do with budgeting uh, that would give near unilateral authority of budgeting over to the county executive. It was a bill that moved forward in December, but it got pulled back because they realized there was an election going on, uh, and the one that was looking for policy authority. Uh, both of those would stop. If I'm the county executive, we'd say we don't want those powers. Same thing with the takeover of our public schools. So we'd you tell the legislature don't you don't want those powers. Exactly. Those are bills that are moving forward at the behest of the current county executive. We would not move those forward. We'd stop the takeover of public schools. We'd do what Mayor Barrett did and say we don't want to take a part in that. And then we'd continue to move forward by reversing the power grabs that have happened already with the legislature. In the meantime, until, you know, because I realize maybe they don't want to do that right away, we'd send a memorandum of agreement with the county board with the public that says we're going to make sure there's American style checks and balances because that's where my heart is. That's what I believe should be there. Let me, let me give you a chance to respond to that sure. and I want to move through some of the issues confronting the county. Yes. Well, you know, uh, to me, one of the easiest examples of uh, why uh, a power grab, and again, I, I still am entirely clear what the sort of you know, uh, metaphorical Death Star looming, looming over Alderaan is I think here. he's saying you're uh, accumulating more power. Right. Well, here's a great example of where I'm not. Uh, I actually advocated to create uh, an elected comptroller, which is not what we had before. I mean, if I wanted power, I suppose I'd say I'd have, you know, that person appointed to me. 
uh, but I didn't. I wanted a comptroller who's the one who has the final say on your money uh, to be able to say that no to me or any board or anyone else in these offices because they should be independent. Uh, the mental health bill we just talked about, uh, that has, among other things, the result of taking the role of management uh, and shifting it away from the county executive's office. Uh, it's one of the biggest departments we have at the county. And the interesting thing about that is, you know, obviously if I wanted more power, I'd say, no, I should you know, be able to unilaterally control it. That's not what I wanted. What I wanted is what we got, which is for the first time, we, after 30 years of calls to end it, we ended the warehouse housing of people. You know, right. ER visits are going down. Right. That's what I wanted. You just get a couple seconds on this and then yeah. we'll move on. I, yeah. think it's, I think it's important as we're talking about just saying that you didn't take power over one individual office doesn't mean that you didn't take power over other places. Say like, I didn't grab it here, so therefore I didn't grab it other places. And on mental health, I mean, talking to, to neighbors in that community, and I've talked to thousands, uh, a week doesn't go by that I don't hear a story, a heartbreaking story of somebody who's dealing with mental health in the current system where they cannot get their public voice house out. And I voted for the bill, but what's happening now is this board is, feels like it, it's responding to the county executive instead of responding to the public. That's a problem, where they put forward a budget. These are the experts. We thought the experts would make the decisions. They asked for 24 hour, two 24 hour crisis resource centers for people who are in crisis. Crisis. This county executive turned them down. They looked for a policy expert to be able to give them information. This county executive turned them down, which is contrary to what the legislation intended. That's where we have a problem. And the only way to hold him accountable is to elect a new county executive. We're going to talk about uh, mental illness and, and our efforts to address it in this community in a little bit. But, but I decided since you've raised it, let's, let's do it right now. Let's get into it. Um, he's saying that the public is not having enough input, uh, County Executive Abley. You, you made it. Uh, a hallmark of your administration. You said we're going to change from long-term institutional care in Milwaukee yeah. County. We're going to go to a community-based model, something you agree with. Mm -hmm. um, but he says along the way, you have people overseeing this effort that aren't the best people to have, that it's not the community. What's your response? Well, first, uh, I don't think, put it this way, if there was a switch that anybody could pull that would say, we're going to go from what everybody agreed uh, was a failing uh, behavioral health division, you know, they did some things well, but obviously they had to do better. If there was a switch that you could just hit and all of a sudden it'd be perfect, everybody would jump. But that's not the way things work. You have to make the progress you can. And here's what nobody disputes. There is nobody uh, who doesn't realize that finally ending uh, the warehousing, the long-term care, uh, was a good thing. I mean, there's nobody who disagrees that we're serving more people. Uh, there's nobody who disagrees that going from 19 or so pure counselors to over 100 to more community-based care, to care with dignity, uh, better results. Uh, I mean, you know, is there work to do? Absolutely. And let's be clear, you know, there's no part of me that's thinking, hey, let's we'll put a trophy on the mantelpiece. But there is nobody who's uh, uh, unclear that this is a better system and it is more likely to stay that way uh, than what we had before. Very briefly. Yeah, I mean, if, if you actually talk to the neighbors that I talk to, that's clearly not the case. And pretending neighbors, just because, of, I mean, just because a, a bill passed and just because some part of the reform happened, that's not a finish line, right? This, is, this race is ongoing. Mental health has not been, uh, mental health diseases have not all been cured, right? So it continues to be urgent that we address each of our neighbors who has uh, mental health illness that we can get and meet them where they are. And I think by, by shutting out the public, and having employees sign silencing agreements that says that they can't talk disparagingly publicly or privately about what's happening, that's discouraging to, to any type of further reform and pretending right. that everything has been done that can be done. That's simply not the case. You have a chance to respond to that. Yeah, sure. So, uh, you know, you brought this up before that uh, I think you call it a gag order before. Uh, the uh, new division has, does have an ethics code, which is new, and that has a lot to do about how you bring up whatever issues you bring up, and you do it in a professional way that makes sense. And it's basically similar, I imagine, to what you have here at Marquette or most high-functioning institutions. There is nothing that prevents people from sharing their opinion but you know to the point about uh, the public input the public input that's most important I think is the public input that led to the journal Sentinel having you know an award-winning series again and again and again chronicling something that had to change uh, you know, when I have an issue, uh, you know, if I, if, I, if I have pain in my chest, I don't want to get public input, I want to talk to a cardiologist. Uh, you know, we, the public input is healthcare system that works. Uh, and here the public input was do better by uh, the Behavioral Health Division. And I don't think anybody disputes, certainly not professionals uh, and the families. 
uh, we're doing that. All right, Senator Larson, I want to go back to something you said just a couple moments ago when you were talking about how we pay for deferred maintenance in our parks. Everybody mm -hmm. in this room, uh, everybody in Milwaukee County uh, loves our park system. It's mm -hmm. what makes us special. Mm -hmm. uh, and then how do we pay for transit in the future? And you said you have an answer to that. Uh, for the people in this room, the people at home, what is that answer? Yeah, the answer is getting a dedicated funding source in the form of a 1% sales tax, which half of which would go to reducing property taxes in a meaningful way. This is something that we, we put out there when I was first elected to public office, and a lot of people said you shouldn't push a sales tax. You know, people they say it's people regressive. Agree with it. Right. And so we looked into it, and the reality is that in Wisconsin, that's not the case because we have so many things that are exempt from sales tax. Now think about it, Mike. If you were in poverty, where would you spend most of your money, right? First, you'd start with rent. That takes a big chunk of it. Rent is not subject to a sales tax. Next, you'd need, need to get groceries, right? Groceries, not subject to a sales tax. Gasoline, gasoline has an index tax that hits it already, but sales tax, the new sales tax would not hit that. On top of that, you have medicine, medical, um, uh, medicine and services. None of those things are subject to a sales tax. So a majority of what you're spending your money on as a perfidy, perf person who's struggling in a working family is not hit by a sales tax. And at the same time, you would stand to benefit the most by actually having access to affordable transit, uh, an expanded transit system that could get you to more jobs that pay a living wage, and a quality park in your neighborhood, which you might not have now because uh, the funds dwindle every single year and deferred maintenance continues to go up. And the big bonus is a sales tax has the, the uh, added feature of one third of it being paid for by folks from outside Milwaukee County so they can help pay into the system, whereas right now they come in as free riders. Would you support a 1% sales tax for, for the purposes which he just articulated? Yeah, economists disagree uh, about whether or not uh, it's regressive. A sales tax is regressive, and why don't you ask the thousands of MPS parents who have to buy school supplies which aren't exempt, clothes, boots. I mean, you know, you go shop for your kids in the winter, it ain't cheap. Uh, and if we're talking about trying to empower uh, the people who need support, you don't do it by making more expensive things that, uh, uh, that they have to buy. Uh, having some exemptions doesn't mean uh, it isn't still hit hard uh, on the things that there aren't exemptions for. And just to say, oh, but there's only a few things, well, that's just it. Those things matter. They cost a lot. Uh, and then there's the other point, which I don't think is irrelevant, is the sales tax right now and for some time now is not currently legal. And regardless of what you think, the state changed the law uh, some time ago, and the party that led that change didn't lose seats in the next cycle. They gained seats. And wh whatever you think, I mean, I'm a big fan yeah. of building plan, you know, plans based on things that work. Let's uh, follow up on this. A couple of points. Yeah. So he's saying uh, you're asking Madison, which is a Republican-controlled legislature, right Republican now. governor, right now. Uh, and probably likely to be that way after November. Would There's you not agree? always an election around the corner. All right. Um, so he's saying that you're not going to be able to do what you're talking about doing. You're promising in your platform that you're going to do this 1% sales tax. That's going to help, but you won't be able to do that. What do yeah. you say? Look, I think that there is absolutely a chance to be able to do this because other counties are struggling for revenue because under Walker's leadership and the Republicans, they have cut off local funding and local control across the state. And so many of the counties, the majority of the counties, have utilized the sales tax available to them, and they're starving for new revenue. Not necessarily for the things that we want, um, but if you allow, if you go to the state and say, the counties are looking for this authority, if you need to bind it to a referendum, give them that authority. They can sell it to the people. If the people vote for it, then they'll go for it. We passed a referendum here. I'm convinced we can do it again. But I think we have to work towards it, right? And I find it funny that the county executive who's gone to Madison to lobby for all kinds of power control and shifts in, in things here is suddenly saying, well, when it benefits the people, when it will benefit the people, well, that's out of the picture. We can't do that. And the fact is, uh, this will actually address deferred maintenance, we'll actually get dedicated funding where we lag behind the rest of the nation, we'll have a clear plan to address deferred maintenance within our parks. And by the way, if we don't do this, the, the people who are struggling to pay for those school supplies, they'll have to pay for it on property taxes, which ours are among the highest in the nation. And I think we cannot rely, we cannot ask our property owners to continue to uh, hold the majority of this burden. We have to share this. They have to, we have to have more people paying into this community, and we can do that through the sales tax. Briefly, County Executive, if you don't do a dedicated sales tax, how do you, how do you get the money you need 
to take care of the deferred maintenance in the parks, sure. to help fund transit, to do the big things that, that yeah. people want done in Milwaukee County. If you don't have that, how are you going to do it? Just by continuing to squeeze efficiencies out well, of county actually, government? You know, it's you interesting. It? I've, uh, uh, I know uh, I get accused sometimes of not giving sentence answers. I give paragraph answers. I get accused of talking about finance a lot, um, and particularly relative to the, the county uh, debt and deficit. But here's the reason. When uh, you start on a billion and a half uh, or so, you know, it's gone down, but a billion uh, plus budget, and your credit card bill uh, is, you know, 70, 80 million dollars, uh, that's money that isn't going to transit, it isn't going to meal programs, senior centers, parks, any of the things we care about. It's the variable we can control. So here's the broad answer. Um, I absolutely agree. If there's an opportunity to have a regional uh, 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 funding supply, a regional transit authority, anything that's consistent, of course we're going to take it. But in the meantime, I'm not simply going to say I'm angry at the people who are the cause of this uh, and just kind of anger my way through it. I'm going to use the tools I have. And so by paying down debt, which is something we do have control over, we uh, you don't have to take my word for it. You can see how much more we've been able to do things like, for instance, put millions more into transit to not raise fares. Uh, but I don't think there's any upside to sort of taking this sort of built-in contrarian approach to one party, particularly when they're in control. You look like you want to say something. Yeah, I mean, I, I just say that there's, in all that answer, there's not a solution for dedicated funding for transit. There's not a solution for dedicated funding for our parks. There's not a solution to reduce property taxes. It's continuing the same Walker-style gimmicks that pretend to freeze property taxes. Well, property taxes under his leadership have gone up $18 million. And so I think it's dishonest to continue to say that uh, and look at, the, look at our county as if it's a spreadsheet. This is a community, and I think it's important to listen to them and push for the things that they want and have that honest conversation yeah. with them. So those numbers on a spreadsheet, Chris, are people. Uh, their salaries, their services we provide, and whether or not you want to acknowledge it, uh, that's how government works. And to say, uh, you know, uh, you didn't hear an answer, what I said is, of course I'm going to work whenever I get an opportunity, uh, whenever I get any kind of opportunity, and I will never start looking for another uh, funding source. I mean, that, we've been pretty creative over the last few years. Uh, we've gotten more federal grants than we have in years, uh, and we have done more service, but to say that it hasn't had an impact, I mean, if you don't think I think thousands more people going through job training programs, license recovery that weren't happening before. An economic development department didn't happen that's creating jobs. You know, that's an impact. Of course, I'm going to keep working at it. Final word on this topic. Yeah, yeah I, think we, I think it's about time we go to the public and we talk to the public about where they want to go as a community. And it's important to make sure that we are, we are making sure that living wage jobs are a priority. And I would just finish by saying, look, if, if, if the, this county executive is going to run on his fiscal sense, I would point at the, the failed Bucks deal, uh, the fact where he put the county. But you walked, voted for the Bucks deal, right. did you not? He's the one who walked into the room. And by the time he walked out, you and I and every other person in Milwaukee County was on the hook for $80 million that they weren't on the hook for before. I mean, it's a bad thing when Scott Walker has a better deal for Milwaukee County than the county executive does. And he did that, $4 million year after year. He did it without the public at the table. He did it by making sure that the public couldn't have oversight over the land sale, over the final authority of it. Uh, and so I would say that, look, if he's going to say he's going to run on his fiscal management, I'd have him explain how he thinks that's a good idea to put us on the hook for $80 million uh, without the public at the table. Why, why did you vote for it? Uh, because I didn't want to see more jobs uh, leave our state. I didn't want to see a major business leave our state. And because when I sat down with the Bucks leadership beforehand, um, I talked to them about the uh, end use jobs, the permanent jobs. And I went to the table having listened to my neighbors and heard what they said. Uh, they wanted to make sure that there was going to be good quality living wage jobs sourced at the people in our community who needed them most. We got that promise from them. Then we went to Madison, we worked with the Republicans. Uh, we took out the part uh, that uh, the county executive put in there that said we're going to pay for the arena. We're actually going after people struggling to pay their, pay their bills in our community. And we also got a service fee, uh, a flat service fee added to the arena deal. Um, and so because of those reasons, we made a bad deal uh, better. But I mean, we only had it for about a week. He had it for, for uh, over half a year. And I think who was in that room matters. We did the best that we could. Uh, we only had a week to work with it. Your response? Yeah, so uh, uh, 
that's not exactly what happened. Uh, the bill, when it came to you, did uh, include the commitment of the county, but it also included a revenue source, which per your request uh, was removed. Right. And if you had an issue, and I talked to you about it at the time, you know, whether or not uh, you are comfortable with the state debt collection program, uh, at, at best, you took out what was a question mark and you left the certainty of the $4 million uh, uh, a year commitment from the county. I mean, did you ask that they take that out as well? Because you knew uh, what you then voted for included the ongoing commitment, $4 million a year, uh, without the revenue source. And just so we're really clear on the backs of the poor part, uh, this program, the state debt collection program, it was based uh, on our friends over in Minnesota who've used it for 20 years, and I don't think anybody thinks, you know, there are a bunch of conservative people who don't care about the poor. They're mm -hmm. fabulously progressive liberal state. The Doyle administration put it in here. You've got over 100 municipalities that use this program. The UW system uses it. Okay. DPI, ask Tony Evers how many more millions he gets, and on the poor part, 200% poverty level, we don't go after. We have we would put more protections in than exist right now, move out a private debt collector, who's who we use, but we go after the corporations and LLCs who do owe and don't pay. They can pay and don't. And I don't know who's sticking up for the t tax I've cheats and scoff laws, but... And again, we still have a hole. I've, I've right. got another question for you in a moment, but but yes. Yeah. So I mean, I mean, the important thing because I think he points at me and pretends that I I was the single person that did this. But the fact is, it was the Milwaukee delegation Demo of the uh, senators and uh, representatives who saw this and said, "Why are we Why are we building an arena for out-of-state billionaires on the backs of people struggling to pay their bills?" And you know, this is a problem where you move forward a deal without going to the public or even public representatives and say, "Hey, do you think this is a good idea?" And they said, "No, let's take that out there." And, and especially when the independent comptroller, which this current county executive cited earlier as being the fiscal manager, said this doesn't add up. And he did it with a long slideshow and said this doesn't add up. He's saying it now as he's trying to move this forward. It doesn't add up. The Wisconsin Counties Association, the Wisconsin Treasurers, the, Wisconsin, the local treasurer all say this doesn't add up. And here's the really important thing. The numbers he's citing, the people he's pointing at that use this service, what they did is they went through the process and they work with the local collectors of debt, the people who are supposed to be in charge of it. And they work with them and they sign it over to the state. I remember talking to you directly mm -hmm. on the Capitol and I said, you can go do this. Call the treasurer, call the clerk of courts, and call the county board, and you can certify the debt directly to them. And what's happened in the seven months since, you never made a phone call to them. They That's came to true. me and said, we never, this guy never talked to me except for today. They said, we're working around you again. That's a problem. That's a problem when he can't even work with the people yeah. in his building to be able to certify debt. There's no reason the yeah. state needs to be at the table. There's no reason yeah. to go directly to Scott Walker with this. Go to the people. Go to your local electeds. Yeah, well, when I think of a, a Minnesota-based program that the Doyle administration, uh, with the support of Democrats, use that many Democrats uh, who are mayors and village presidents use, uh, I don't think of Scott Walker. But here's the thing. Uh, first, to the point about the numbers adding up, you know, I haven't been able over four, uh, the last five years to lower uh, the liabilities as much as I have, improve our credit rating in a way this was not happening before. I mean, the should it stay or should it go is now in the public policy form, latest analysis, right. remarkable turnaround. I didn't do that by taking a lot of risk. This can work, but nobody disputes. You take out a revenue source and you leave in the expense, well, guess what? Uh, you've got a $4 million hole. I have yet to hear any, let, you know. Let me ask a, a brief follow-up on that, yeah. though. Um, the argument is is that you sort of negotiated this deal single-handedly, yeah. that it was not a collaborative effort, that there were right. other people from the county not involved, there were not Milwaukee uh, lawmakers, state lawmakers involved. Why did you do that? Because you're representing all of the people in Milwaukee County. Yeah, sure. So the single-handedly part, uh, as Senator Larson knows, uh, when you're dealing with lots of different elected officials who represent different areas, uh, all of whom need to sign off, it is very rarely the case that when everybody comes in uh, with an idea of what they want, they walk out with exactly what they want. But the why uh, had nothing to do with a stadium for billionaires. It had to do with what's already happened. It had to do with an empty part of downtown. Park East been sitting there for 15 years empty and not because people didn't try. Suddenly we're talking potentially a billion dollars worth of investment. You know, since that deal was signed, we've had five projects in the last five months we've announced on that land, $82 million. That was not happening before. $450 million uh, uh, on the pipeline, and that's before you get to. I mean, this is jobs that so, we have never had. So no regrets. And so that's why it mattered to doing it on your own. You have no regrets. But in, remember, in terms I don't get to. He voted on it. 
Uh, all we can do is suggest a deal, and uh, which is why, uh, and, and this is something I know Senator Larson's yeah. familiar with because it's how a lot of things happen. You know, it, the, the amount of times that the thing you get to vote on is exactly what you want is surprisingly little, but that's okay. You can work to try an improvement, but you don't improve it when you leave in a liability and you pull out revenue. Again, I mean, that's budgeting. Again, the final word on this topic. Yeah, I mean, I just wish you would have listened to the comptroller, independent comptroller, who balances the books and said, this deal does not add up. I wish you would have listened to the representatives, the senators who said, this deal doesn't add up. Don't build it on the backs of people struggling to pay their bills. And I wish he would have, at the very least, allowed for land sales to continue in a democratic way with American-style checks and balance with the public at the, at the table. Because it hasn't, Mike, we ended up selling this land. He ended up selling it for a buck. And not only that, they got change, right? Because his, his excuse was saying, well, there's these underlying cleanup costs. But because he's a bad negotiator on behalf of the county, they actually, the, the taxpayers are going to have to pick up the cleanup costs too to the tune of over $5 million. That's, what's hap that's what happens when you have one person at the table who thinks that these, he's smarter than the public. It's, you, it's not allowable anymore. I think we need, gotta a, be we need very, a new county executive who's going to look out for the public. It's got to be very brief. Okay. Uh, so the same county board was perfectly willing to sell the same parcel of land for a dollar when Coles, as you all remember, was considering moving their headquarters downtown because it was a similarly large-scale deal. Not because people were thinking, hey, uh, we're losing out on some of the very small amount that we could potentially get for the land, but because we're getting you know, the same thing in this case, hundreds of millions of dollars invested and thousands of jobs where there were none. I want to get to uh, some topics that are front and center for, for people in this community. I want to talk for a couple of minutes about the domes. Mm -hmm. um, and, and this is, uh, I think, Senator Larson, you've sort of said this is emblematic of mm -hmm. the deferred maintenance issue in the Milwaukee County mm -hmm. Parks, that there's concrete crumbling from the ceiling, and now we're going to have to do some repairs to get it open again. But the question I have tonight is, if it turns out that this is going to cost 45 or 55 or 65 or 75 million dollars. Mm -hmm. Is there a point where repairing this iconic uh, three domes uh, just doesn't make fiscal sense anymore for the county? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's, uh, this is something that's near and dear to, to my heart, like most people who are born here, raised here, and lived here uh, for their entire life. Um, my, my parents, I think it's a couple times a week now, send me pictures of when I was there as a kid. Uh, this is where I take my kids in, in winter when they need to run around. We don't have weather as, like, as nice as it is now. And uh, I think it's a, it's a gut check, right, when they say the domes are in trouble. This is a, it's a symbol of Milwaukee. We've got to do what we can. Put on your rally hats. Let's, let's figure it out. That's what we heard when I went to the public hearing uh, from hundreds of neighbors who wanted to see our domes uh, rebuilt. And I'm pledging to do that, to make sure that, look, this is, this is important to us. It's a regional asset, and we need to figure out how we're going to do that. Um, and I think it's, uh, it's important. His, his estimates have been severely inflated. I've talked to other park experts who he used to work He says 75, you say 45. Yeah, they say it's about 15 million per dome uh, for a rebuild. And these are people who used to work in the parks yeah. department but uh, couldn't work with him, so they're no longer there. Um, but they say we can do this for, for a lot cheaper. Now, I think it's important. Look, the public is clearly there on this. Um, I just think it's different, especially the transition where you move from the bucks over to the domes, that when the, when the bucks were happening, there was a, a push to make sure this happened. No time to go to the public, no time to have public input. But now, with the domes, all of a sudden, all you see are brake lights of saying, well, hold on here. This, this might cost, you know, throw out $75 million. The highest estimate I've seen from anyone was from him. And suddenly, we need to have a slow public input with, with a selection committee that's by him. And uh, there's no commitment to reopening the domes until after this election is over. I think it's, it's, it's interesting that it's suddenly he's found religion on actually allowing the public at the table when it's something that's important to us. When it was something that was important to him, he was fine with working around the public. Are, are you open to the idea of tearing down the, the domes? I think you well, suggested that in recent interviews, yeah, that, that if the public said, hey, we here's can't afford this. Here's what I said. Uh, well, first, to the point of the cost, uh, you know, this isn't my estimate. Uh, and as Senator Larson knows, the domes have had issues for almost 30 years. We We've done repair and big repair projects, and almost invariably, those repairs, the, on the analysis we've gotten, people have said, hey, these are going to get older, these repairs are going to get more frequent. Fifty years ago, we were closing a Victorian conservatory that had the same problem. It was beautiful. People loved it. They had family members. I would have loved it. But it was having more and more and more frequent, costly repairs. And finally, people said, you know what? Before we go and build, rebuild the whole thing, let's think boldly. Let's at least give ourselves a chance to the community uh, to say, hey, do we want to rebuild the whole thing? Or maybe 
maybe we want to do something that's kind of un Milwaukee and look forward. And anybody who doesn't think going from the Victorian Conservatory to the domes, which at the time weren't just catching up, that was bleeding edge. Is there a it price is. point so, that, that, of, of which you're not willing to go beyond in terms of repairing the domes? Here's what I mean about the public input. Uh, to Senator Larson's point, I think it's interesting. He said, look, we got to keep it. Well, oh, do we want to hear from the public too? And by informed public input in the committee we're talking, I think we should say, I don't see this as a challenge. I see this as an extraordinary opportunity to say, what if, instead of serving 250,000 people there, what if it was more like 500,000 like they used to or more? What if it wasn't, instead of losing money like they do right now, what if, like some of the other things they've done, they gain revenue? What if six partners of, in the nonprofit committee turned to 30? Uh, what if we did something that could do more and better? And by the way, I'd love to show you some examples to the public. And if the public sees that and sees the cost and they still say, nope, we're going with the domes, great. I just want to make sure it's not my money, it's your money. I want to check. Briefly, Senator Larson. Yeah, I mean, there was warning signs on this, right, where there was a $5 million put forward by, uh, put forward to be able to say, let's address some of the deferred maintenance that's growing in our parks. Uh, this county executive vetoed that. When they moved forward and said, we're going to do it anyways, they moved forward with $500,000 to help the domes. He refused to sign that. Uh, when there was a warning sign that said that there's chunks of concrete falling, you might need to get some nets, he didn't act. And now that it's saying that the domes are all closed off, Right. Suddenly, there's a set of a comparison that's uh, a comparison that says that suddenly our parks are supposed to make money or they're not valuable to us. That's such a dangerous precedent for 156 parks. If your local park isn't turning revenue, suddenly that means we need to restructure it so it does. I think that sets a dangerous precedent for somebody who went to Madison for the authority to be able to sell land without public approval. It moves us in the wrong direction. The uh, domes are important to us. Our parks yeah. are important to us. And I need to, I'm going to uh, get elected. I'm going to help continue that legacy. That's my plan. Very, very briefly, please. Okay. So uh, nobody is saying that we can't have uh, uh, venues or, or assets that uh, don't make money. But I don't think there's anybody here who disagrees that when we can provide for the public like, like say the beer gardens which they love create local jobs because we partner with local breweries have more amenities for the public and generate just last year just for the beer garden six hundred and thirty five thousand dollars which goes back into parks i mean no harm in looking right uh, we'll, we'll pursue you know. this point a little bit further but uh, very quickly from yeah. each of you just to get your position on the esterbrook park dam mm -hmm. um, the dnr says the dam is dangerous uh, that you got to make a decision either you tear it down or you repair it Chris Abley, should it sure. be torn down or should it be repaired? Uh, it should we be, should say this is on the Milwaukee River in the Glendale right. area. Yeah, yeah it should yeah. be torn down. Uh, I've been involved you know, with another torn hat, down. Uh, torn down with uh, uh, a lot of environmental groups, including chairing the River Revitalization Foundation for years. And many of you may remember, we took down the North Avenue Dam. And there was the same small group of people who predicted yeah. disaster, but instead, more land, higher property values, cleaner water, and you don't have to pay nature to be nature. Senator Larson, uh, would you support tearing down the dam or do you support repairing it? So when I was a county supervisor, there was a vote on this. And what right. we did is, what you should do, is you listen to the public. We had a public hearing. Uh, hundreds of people showed up. And uh, the results were overwhelmingly saying that we should keep the dam and preserve the dam. So that's where the policy went. Now, that was six, seven years ago. Since then, not much has happened except for a lot of squabbling between the county executive and the county board. And so now as I look at it, and I'm hearing about it from more people, from both sides of it, and I realize that I think the opinion may have changed on this, where people are moving more to the mindset of saying, uh, let's tear it down. Um, so if it's not solved by the time, uh, if I'm lucky enough to be elected, and if by the time I'm in there, this has not been solved, as county executive, I'll work with the county board to do a public hearing, listen to the public on this, listen to the science on this, see where it's at. And if it has moved, and if the public is saying to tear it down, we'll do it by the end of the year. I've got a number of issues I want to move through pretty quickly. And this one uh, is uh, sort of out there a bit, but, but not that far out there. In 2008 and 2009, there were some pretty serious discussions in this town about whether or not we should sell Mitchell International Airport. Mm -hmm. Sell it or lease it. Uh, could make a billion dollars if you sold it. Um, and we should say this, that this is not common in the United States. It is common in some other parts of the world. Mm -hmm. um, you're both talking about the need to have money for deferred maintenance for parks. You're talking about the need to be able to hold down uh, the cost of transit because you need a dedicated revenue stream. You're talking about all of the needs that exist out there. Mm -hmm. 
Would you be open to discussing the possibility of selling Mitchell International Airport? You're shaking your head. You're not no. letting me finish the question no, here. The Would no. you? <laughs> Keep going, but no. <laughs> well, that's pretty much the end of it. So, so this will be a really short segment. So, yeah. yeah Good. No. We can have other questions. No. Yeah. Um, I think. Look. The why not? Because the airport, the airport is independent of the county. Although it's on, uh, operated by the county, it's wouldn't you like to be able to do all that work in the parks? It's and revenue other neutral. The airport is revenue neutral. Yeah. One of the great things about our airport is that it has uh, low gate fees. It has low delays. Right? You can find parking for cheaper than you can at O'Hare. Uh, you can fly in and out a lot easier. Um, it's one of the assets that can help fuel um, fuel our economy. And uh, I think we should okay. use it as that. There's a lot of growth up until this county executive got in office. We've gone through, I don't know, how many airport directors have we gone through now? Four? And so you need to have some steady hand at the wheel to make sure that they are attracting new airlines and uh, growing gates and attracting passengers from northern Illinois so we can actually compete with O'Hare. And so to do that, I, I don't think we should end up mixing it up and selling it and suddenly having to pay a board of directors six-figure salaries to do that. What? All you need is one good airport director. And by the way, the airport provides a half a billion dollar um, asset that helps our underlying bond rating. I don't want to lose that. Um, you, I also want to make sure it's under public control. Let me, let me get you on the record. Would you support looking at that, or is that not even a possibility? Yeah, it's not even a possibility. So the, the program you're talking about, this Triple P <coughs> program, uh, the only airport I know in the country that came close to this Midway. was at Midway, right. Um, and obviously they turned it down, and there's a lot of good reasons to turn it down, and a lot of which uh, 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 were listed by uh, Senator Larson. Uh, in terms of uh, the director, I'm incredibly proud of uh, our new airport director. He's fantastic. Uh, when you have uh, 41 business lines and a lot of staff, uh, you know, uh, you mix somewhere between having a director for 30 years like we did before, and sometimes you do turnover. But here's the thing. What you're always going to have to do is whatever happens, uh, whether it goes the way you want or not, uh, you don't spend a lot of time, I don't think we're serving anybody mm -hmm. by sort of dwelling on it or pointing, or you don't solve it by pointing fingers, you move on and you hire someone good. But here's the thing, during that time we've expanded service, it's just another story today, and uh, you know, adding airlines, adding coverage, adding passengers, uh, I think we're well positioned, yeah, but yeah, forgive no me for, for moving quickly through some of these yeah, issues I, here. I mean, just just real quick, I would real say, quick. look, nationwide airline usage is up for January. I don't think the current county executive can take credit for the entire nation suddenly He's using airlines even more. Assigning blame for but it. I, if you want to take credit for the entire nation, that's fine. Go ahead. You, um, yeah. you can take credit for the, the good weather, too. Um, but I would say on top of this, uh, he put the airport at risk through power that he asked for and hasn't explained at the state level. So even though I'm saying absolutely not to privatization or selling, he's saying that now. Uh, the thing is, now it becomes that much easier, whether it's this county executive uh, or some future county executive, to tee it up to make it that much easier to shift it to private control. That's what's dangerous and that's what's different uh, or will be different about my leadership. And this has got to be very brief, please. Yeah. Uh, well, actually, uh, uh, I don't he know said you that put that's the, the, the airport at risk. at risk. Yeah, well, it turns out we get a lot of federal support, and uh, I'm fairly certain that if I just said, hey, I'm, I'm selling the airport, somebody from Washington would be calling up soon. In the same way we need federal approval just to sell uh, the transit center for the couture, uh, you know, the, uh, this is not something you can do independent of the federal government beside the fact that uh, it is nothing that anybody is particularly did, interested I mean, did, in doing. He did cut out a layer of public approval of it by oh, cutting out the county. Budget. I'm going to take a couple minutes to, to talk about something that, that is not um, uh, what we wish it to be in Milwaukee County. If you look at the metrics uh, in, in this uh, county, um, too many of our African American neighbors are struggling. Um, joblessness, poverty. What is the role of the county executive in addressing population, population in the county. county? I'll begin with you. Sure, sure. Uh, uh, the role, the role is, is to do absolutely do anything we can. Uh, you know, recently uh, we had the creation of the Office of African American Affairs, and one of the things I'm really excited about is uh, I've spent uh, with a lot of department and division heads and uh, countless groups in town a lot of time uh, first gathering data. So, hey, you want to tackle a problem? Let's get specific about what we're talking about and let's get the numbers and let's talk where and how. Then let's map out every possible variable, every possible tool, uh, lever we can pull to make a difference. So, I've already talked to uh, every department head and said, look, where do we have an impact on this community? Um, even, even the things that maybe we don't think are, are directly impacting, what could we do differently? How could we reallocate? And we will. Uh, 
And, uh, but in the meantime, the things we have direct control over, you know, I didn't wait. I mean, for five years, we've been investing more uh, in the criminal justice system to try and keep people from being incarcerated in the first place. Anybody who doesn't think the fact that Wisconsin has the highest rate uh, of incarceration for African Americans, anybody who doesn't think that's an outrage uh, is not paying attention. But the difference is, all right, what can we do about it? Well, we run the House of Corrections, so no more Nutriloaf and Bullhorns, because that's what we were doing before. We took over management, and now it's health care, GEDs, job preparation. On top of that, we've added in departments that have little to directly do it, like child support, job training, job placement, license recovery. We've added uplift, which are targeted toward 53206, uh, and we will do more. Is it enough? No, but it's more than what we've done, and that is my highest priority going Senator forward. Senator Larson. I find it disturbing that the county executive, and this is like the third time this has happened when asked about what we can do for employment in the African American community and addressing disparities, that his mind goes over to the House of Corrections. Now, That's not when, I, I, said. when I, said. I when I talk to uh, my neighbors in the African American community, they are looking for quality jobs. They are looking for a seat at the table. They are looking for empowerment. And that's what we offer by going out in the community and actually listening to people. That's why I've gained the support of people like Congresswoman Gwen Moore and Vel Phillips. It's about making sure that, look, I have a history of fighting for working families in our community. And I'll continue to do that at the county executive level. Um, I fought for a living wage at the state level. I encouraged it at the county level. This county executive vetoed a living wage. But not only that, he went to Madison to try try and stop it from being enacted. When there was a program that would hire people who are struggling to find work in the Ready to Work program, uh, he vetoed it down uh, to a fraction of what it could have been to be able to give people the job training that they need. And when it came time to, to be able to appoint somebody to the MATC board who represents Milwaukee, who represents the place where people are going to get jobs, he appointed somebody uh, from outside of the county. Now, all of those things show a, a painful disconnect with what's actually happening in our neighborhoods uh, and I'll be somebody who's in the community, not just because there's an election, but well after it, and making sure that there is representation. The Office of African American Affairs is coming yes. forward because of a lack of action by the current county executive, uh, not because of his urging. Yeah, 30 seconds to respond. Yeah, please. so uh, for probably the last 20 years, uh, I've spent uh, thousands of hours volunteering, uh, supporting and raising money for groups like the Boys and Girls Club, not hundreds of thousands, millions. We serve 43,000 kids. I don't tweet or post about that. It's not what I'm doing. Uh, I do it because I care. I'll do it. But I did it before I was in office. I will do it after in my office. Uh, I've worked on everything from the Covenant Foundation that Doyle set up for free tuition to the Promise Foundation, MATC. Uh, we have added so many more programs that serve more African Americans than we ever did. I'm not going to be backseat to anybody. Is it enough? Absolutely not. But it's just silly. Uh, Briefly, uh, Senator Larson, you mentioned the living wage. Help yeah. people in this audience uh, and yeah. at home understand what exactly you're calling for. Are you talking about a $15 an hour minimum wage in Milwaukee County for all businesses? Are you talking about an increase in the minimum wage beyond $11.5 for county workers and people doing business for the county? What are you calling for? Yeah, we're talking about moving forward to the inf areas of influence where the county has uh, control over. So when we are negotiating economic development, uh, that'll be a key point that we ask for, of saying let's move move towards $15 minimum wage so that the people working uh, at the benefit of, of Milwaukee County tax dollars are going to be uh, going to be able to earn a living, that they're not going to be struggling in poverty, worried about, worried about their home being foreclosed on or worried about paying their bills. And so it's about making sure that where we have that sphere, sphere of influence for those who are in the county and those who are benefiting from county economic development dollars, uh, that's important. Um, that's something we fought for. We have to move for a, a, gra a big change at the state level and we'll continue to advocate for that uh, as is being advocated on the national level. But I think we need to do, when we're spending public dollars, it should be about impl improving the public good. I'll let you respond. Uh, two right, things yeah. on uh, the living wage. I didn't, uh, what I vetoed wasn't the living wage. It was losing $28 million that the comptroller said uh, that was going to come from family care, a program with which we serve the frail and elderly. There's nobody who disagrees with the idea of paying people whatever wage we possibly can, but doing it sustainably. 
Uh, and what I'd like to do, and I will continue to work hard to do, is do it in a way where we can't, you know, it isn't just that we can do it one year, we can keep doing it without coming at the cost of anything else. I mean, there's nobody, you know, I don't think, uh, you know, who wants to see less support for family care, but in terms of African Americans, when you were Senate Minority Leader, it was your choice and yours alone uh, to create on Joint Finance Committee the first time in 30 years you didn't have an African American or even someone from Milwaukee. That was your choice. I mean, you know, I'm not sure how that increases representation for Milwaukee. By taking Lena Taylor. Yeah, Lena Taylor and I don't get along. I mean, that's the end of it. That's the beginning end of it because she's supported, she's supported my opponent. She continues to support my opponents. But that's it's not between... about opponents. It's about the public. I mean, he so really cares okay. about her constituents. And I don't think anybody suggests I mean, if otherwise. If we're going to talk about Lena Taylor, it wasn't me that voted her out of leadership of the African American Caucus. Mm -hmm. Let me uh, uh, end this part of it before we go to uh, final statements. The hour's gone by very quickly. But I want, uh, there's been a lot of talk this week about what people have said and done in the past. Mm -hmm. and, and I want to end our discussion with that. And I know this is not a popular topic with either one of you, but I'm going to ask about it anyhow. Um, let me begin with uh, Senator Larson. Uh, year 2000, a shoplifting citation when you were a college student. 2004, disorderly conduct citation that was dropped, mm -hmm. but involved a pretty heated argument with a tow truck operator in Milwaukee. 2008, you started a PAC, Political Action Committee, um, but you had to forfeit $1,500 because you weren't disclosing who the donors to the PAC were. You were urged to do that mm -hmm. by the Elections Commission mm -hmm. and by uh, the DA. Um, you know, should people have reservations about your judgment? And what have you learned from those experiences? Yeah. I, and, and please keep your remarks fairly Sure, brief. sure. I mean, I've owned, I've owned my mistakes. And we've talked about these, right? It's part of the, it's one of the uh, unique perks of running for public office is the people dig through your past and they find the things that are, uh, that you're not so proud of. And you have to explain those, right? Uh, politicians aren't perfect. And um, I'm fine with explaining these things. Now, on the shoplifting thing, I've, I just explained this with right. Dan Bice recently, and I think it's, it's something that when explained to a judge, I, I went through a program and it was dropped completely. The only reason it came up is because I was running for office. Uh, th same thing with the, uh, the disorderly conduct charge. That was something when I explained it to a judge, it was dropped. The fact is, uh, I thought someone was stealing a car that I had just bought, and I actually called the police. And when I explained that to them, uh, they dropped it. This was dropped in court. Um, and on the PAC, uh, that was something where, as a new county supervisor, was pushing for the referendum uh, and was doing this as a new representative. And, uh, and uh, once they pointed it out, we reported everything that we needed to. Uh, I'm fine with opening up to my mistakes. And what it does is it allows me to look in the eyes of my neighbors, who I have conversations with, and realize, you know, had one of those judges ruled in a different way or had uh, a course of history taken a different turn, I could just be, I could be in their shoes. And I think it's, it's developed. Uh, that sense of realizing, look, it's, it's about looking out for your neighbors, because I could be in their shoes. So I, I can speak for them uh, in a stronger way when I'm, uh, when I'm in, uh, in charge. In fairness, and I've got to do this very quickly, and we have to get to closing statements, which will have to be a bit shorter. A drunk driving citation, uh, arrest in, in 96, wasn't settled to 2003. Uh, $2,000 in parking tickets uh, from 2007 to 11. Uh, what does it say about your judgment? Oh, I'd say that, you know, if I could go back in time, and I've said this plenty of times uh, on uh, drunk driving, I'd go back and punch myself. Uh, and not just because it was a stupid decision for me, it was a stupid decision for anybody else. Uh, you know, uh, it's something that uh, I, no excuses, I take full accountability. It was a stupid, stupid thing. There's, you know, end of sentence, full stop. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, as Senator Larson said, it is, uh, you know, one of the you know, perks of being in public office. But those yeah. are fair questions and people should ask. You know, I've made mistakes, absolutely. And I expect to be held, up account uh, held accountable for it. I'm going to uh, bring you now to closing statement. Senator Larson, you're going to go first. And we're going to have to keep him more like, you know, 30 seconds. Just tell us why you're the guy. Yeah. Um, so. Thank you very much to the viewers. Uh, thank you to uh, everybody who is paying attention to this important election. Um, you have an important decision to make about the future of Milwaukee County. Um, I was born here, raised here, lived here my entire life. Um, and this is where I'm raising my family. I want to make sure that every family has access to a quality park. Uh, that's something that's important to uh, me. It's important to our neighbors. Um, Milwaukee County is heading in the wrong direction right now, and I think we can move forward by increasing access to living wage jobs, by ensuring that you have a seat at the table, um, by doing community listening sessions in each of our communities year after year. So I ask for your support uh, and your vote April 5th so we can move Milwaukee County forward again. Thank you. County Executive Abley, uh, why are you uh, the guy who should be elected? 
Well, uh, first, uh, because uh, I'm increasingly feeling I'm not a standard politician. Um, I don't think about how I'm going to make a headline or how I'm going to win a fight. I think about how I'm going to move the party, uh, or move the party, move the county forward. Uh, I don't uh, uh, have. I'm not in office because I have a, a, a notion of a future career in politics, uh, and because I've done what I said I was going to do. And right now, we're in better shape fiscally. I have a better team than I ever had. We know more about what we're doing. Uh, and we're just getting started. I want to keep that momentum going. I'd be incredibly honored and privileged to, to have that opportunity. Milwaukee County Executive Chris Abley, State Senator Chris Larson, we appreciate your time tonight. Thanks to everybody at home for watching and for the people here at Eckstein Hall. I'm Mike Goucher. Uh, we appreciate it. And we'll see you back here Friday and again next Tuesday. More conversations with the candidates. <laughs>